start anything, just the emergency exits, this door here, and there's also an exit at the back. So I think that's important to know from the very beginning. Uh, thank you for coming to this opening session of the 2018 Desmond Green Summer School. My name is Kevin McCurry and I'm the school director. So welcome to the what is the 30th school. So since 1989, the school has hosted an ongoing analysis of the conditions of Ireland and its relations with the wider world in the context of the political and theoretical le legacy of Desmond Greaves. Desmond Greaves believed that in an era of the EU and European integration and near global dominance by the transnational capital, the most important task for Democrats and the labor movement was to join in an international movement in defense of national democracy and the nation state, the latter as the essential locus for imposing democratic control on capital. Ireland has two national problems. Partition, it's obviously the most graphic and obvious one, but also the loss of democracy to the EU, to which has been surrendered the main legislative, executive, and judicial powers necessary to develop an independent national economy. To this must be added the complete abandonment of Irish neutrality. Ending partition is not a standalone end in itself. It is a means to independence. There was no partition from 1800 to 1820, 1921, but there was no national independence either. Mainstream Ulster Unionism would have been quite content to accept a united Ireland as long as Britain ruled the whole. North and South have effectively been semi-united under Brussels' rule in recent decades with the EU making most economic laws for both Ireland and Britain. The problem in Ireland is not that there is a frontier between the area of London's jurisdiction and Dublin's, but that the Irish-British border is in the wrong place. The border should be around the island of Ireland and not between the six and the 26 counties. And within those borders, the Irish people should rule their own state, make the laws and decide policy for a united country, and determine freely in relation its relations with other states and peoples. All powers and capacities that are either abolished totally or significantly truncated by EU membership both for the Irish and other nationalities affected. Irish unity is only valuable as the basis of Irish independence. Unity has always been possible without independence. The national struggle is not just about undoing partition and bringing about a united Ireland. It is also about establishing real independence and undoing the, the conquest as James, in James Connolly's phrase. So that's my opening harangue for the night. It gives me great pleasure to uh, say a few words about uh, the chair of tonight's session before he in turn will introduce Ray Bassett. Thomas Pringle is the independent TD for Donegal South West. Just a brief word about Thomas's case before the Irish Supreme Court and the EU Court of Justice against the European Stability Mechanism, which is mentioned in the brochure. In Thomas's case, the ECJ found in an intensely political judgment 
that the establishment of a permanent bailout fund, fund for the Eurozone, the European Stability Mechanism, did not violate the ban on government bank bailouts which were in EU treaties. Thus the EU implied that the 28 EU member states, their parliaments and governments, which had come together to amend the EU treaties to permit the establishment of such a permanent bailout fund for the Euro, had essentially been wasting their time. It was bizarre, to say the least of it. They'd been amending the treaties unnecessarily because the presumed permission of all 28 was not legally required. The court ruled that the Eurozone subgroup of states had the right to make such a treaty among themselves intergovernmentally. This opens the way, it's quite obvious, opens the way for a whole series of further treaties for the countries using the euro which do not require unanimity as EU treaties do. They can therefore be pushed through by the bigger eurozone states regardless of objections from the smaller ones. This opens the prospect of a permanent division of the EU between eurozone and non-eurozone countries with major implications for the future of both. In taking the case, Thomas acted in, in, in taking the case, Thomas risked having to bear substantial costs running into hundreds of thousands of euros should the courts award costs against him. We owe Thomas Pringle a deep debt of gratitude for his courage and determination in seeing his case through to the European Court, especially when we remember that at the time he was just a young TD with a young family, with all the implications that, that, that he could have uh, been landed on him uh, should he have been fixed with the cost. So, Great pleasure in handing over to Thomas. Um, thanks very much, Kevin, and uh, thanks very much for that introduction. It was uh, uh, interesting. Was, was, was the one thing I would say in relation to the cost is I didn't know about it at the time, so there could have been a difference if I had. Um, but ignorance is bliss a lot of the time in, in, pol in life and politics, anyway. So we're here tonight for the the session that I, I like it is a realistic possibility is the question that we're asking and to pose that question for us we have Dr. Ray Bassett and Ray is a native of Dublin as far as I, I think and has a background in the natural science, sciences which I understand is kind of unusual for somebody who worked for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Ray worked in the Department of Foreign Affairs in the Department of the Taoiseach and was very instrumental I think in relation and through the Northern Peace process and is also a former Irish ambassador to Canada and an active participant in the, P in the Northern Peace Process, author of studies on Brexit and Ireland for the Politia and the Policy <coughs> Exchange think tanks in Britain, and a critic of the Irish government's policy on Brexit, and that's probably why you haven't heard much about this. Lady Pringle for the, for the introduction, um, but it also be very remiss of me not to say at the very start that I want particularly to thank Tony Coughlin, um, since I, as somebody says, since I came out of the closet <laughs> in terms of politics, uh, Tony's been a great friend and a great mentor. And in fact, it's been, even though I, you know, had attitude, you know, I had been developing my thoughts on, on, on this issue for a long time, I've been an internal critic for a long time, uh, Tony has been very, very good in sort of fleshing out ideas uh, with me and, and sometimes get me to realise exactly what I've been saying and the implications of it and I just want to say a very big thanks to him not only for that, um, which is a very minor part, but for the huge contribution he's made to political life in this country. It's, we've been greatly enriched by the... <laughs> and his wife Muriel obviously as well. Um, firstly I just want to say this is uh, going to be uh, 
you know, in some ways reflections uh, from a personal perspective, and I speak for nobody, and uh, despite what I said in the media, I'm not associated with any political party, and I don't intend to ever be associated with a political party, having been 39 years in government service, and having been paid to say things, often which I didn't 100% agree with, I really value being able to say everything that what I want now, and damn the consequences, you know, the only one who'll take it is myself. Uh, just to return for a second to, 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 to the Tony's area, I've got to keep an eye on the time too, I don't rub it on too long. Uh, you know, I don't think Tony or Patricia McKenna or Raymond Crotty ever realised the amount of time that government spent discussing them. You'll find nothing in papers, but the number of discussions I was at where people were, people were talking about how to reverse the, the judicial... Uh, the judicial activity or the, ju or the or judicial activism uh, is unbelievable, you know, right down to talking about how could you get the Supreme Court to make changes and things like that. Um, it really was uh, an, an interesting issue. And it's something which perplexed me right from the start is the actual enmity that, uh, that the public side have for people who don't agree with them on Europe. Like, I spend all my time uh, the vast majority of my time in the north we would have regular discussions with everybody and you know we, we never really took personally uh, criticism from people and in fact you would regularly listen to other people's arguments and you would try and, and incorporate them and see if there's any value but um, there was a sensitivity and a, an intolerance uh, on matters relating, relating to Europe and uh, a good example of that was uh, although I was a critic uh, I remember immediately after the Nice referendum, within two or three days I was called in and asked could I give some ideas about overcoming the, <coughs> the, the, the results of the referendum. There was no real interest in actually, uh, despite all the rhetoric, in respecting the democratic result. And I remember saying to both the politicians and things, that, but I voted no. And, I said, <laughs> and they said, I don't care if you voted no. We want somebody to be creative. We want somebody to, to find new ways of going around it. With your personal views of yourself, you can go off and but come back with a few, with a, with a piece of paper as to what it was. So there was never any great, uh, great desire to accept the democratic results. And another thing I can tell you from inside government, there was no pressure from Brussels on reversing that. They didn't have to because there were so many people locally more than willing to, 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 do, to do the dirty work, if you like to put it like that. So from being an internal critic all the time and arguing at these, I, uh, I, 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 when I retired, I obviously the opportunity would have came to say what I, what I really thought. Now, the, also, whenever I hear a speaker, the first thing I always ask is, what's the motivation? What's the beef here? What's behind this person? You know, you get so many ads on the television where they're talking about, you know, you see a beautiful family and then you suddenly realise they're trying to sell mortgages. So, I just want to say that uh, I, did, I had no beef in, 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 in the argument. Even on the Sunday Business Post, I don't take any money for it. I don't do anything. I just try to say this because after 40 years, I can say what I think. I'm not interested in anything other than trying to get out a counter-argument. And I think that Ireland has been very badly served by our devotion to the sacred cows. And one of the few sacred cows left is the European Union. Uh, and as I was saying to Thomas earlier, when I was going to write my first article critical of the government, I, needless to say, with my own department, I wasn't going to get them blinded. So I sent a message to them saying, by the way, I'm, I'm writing an article in the Sunday Business Post. It's going to be critical of the government. It's nothing personal. It's just I don't agree with the policy, and uh, I'd like to, 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 to make a different policy. And the re reaction was very harsh. And, uh, you know, um, I, got a, I got a text from one of the most senior people in the department saying, you are never to use the title former ambassador again. Now, I never use the title former ambassador. People don't go around describing themselves. Other people describe you. Uh, and essentially, from then, that moment on, I've been, become a bit of a black sheep for the family. And anyone who's been talking to journalists will know that people have been sniping. But so what? You know, when you finish a job, you must well go on. Uh, anyway, I, 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 enjoy, I had a very, very good time in that department in the sense that they were both personally and, and professionally. I didn't leave with huge regrets or no chip on my shoulder about it. But I was very disappointed. But it does point out that this is an area where... Uh, people seem to 
have a, a, a huge degree of insecurity. And uh, I can't understand it because given the, the very pro-European, general pro-European flavour of the, of the public, you wonder why. Why, could, why should people be sensitive about this? In fact, you should, if you're confident in your argument, you should be glad to take on other arguments because it actually strengthens you. I, again, I don't keep going back to the peace process, but there was a small a group established um, by the Irish government and uh, in, in preparing papers for Good Friday and things like that. And at the end of the, the discussions, you would have heard every criticism possible of what you're putting forward or what the government's putting forward. So when you came out, the criticism and the discussions afterwards were never as harsh as the internal criticism, but the internal criticism were always regarded as good and never felt that there was any degree of personal animosity about it. Uh, so I just say that uh, that's a, 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 a flavour. The other motivation I had was because uh, I, my family are north south. My 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 my, my grandkids live in Belfast. My son lives in Belfast. My Granny's from Tyrone, uh, right across the thing. So, as I was coming towards retirement, um, the whole issue of Brexit was coming up. I was still in, uh, as Irish ambassador to Canada, so I would still be in the, you know, in the outer fringes of things going around. And to be honest with you, I was stunned by the kind of dismissal attitude to uh, stuff that had gone on previously. Um, all the people, the people, both on the political side and the official side, who had dealt with with, 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 with most of the peace process, had moved on. They'd all gone to various places and things like that. And I remember speaking to some of the main negotiators when David Cameron announced that he was going to run, run with a Brexit uh, referendum. And what was the Irish government going to do? And the first, the first thing I said, well, like you know, if Brexit occurs, this could be very dangerous in Ireland. It could damage community relations in the north. It could damage north, south and east, west. And I was told, no, no, that's, you're looking at this from the old point of view. Our future is with Brussels. You're far too orientated on the old. You're an old dinosaur from the previous period. And that there is no question, and these are all the experts, but the referendum is going to be defeated and we have got to be as harder than anyone else in it because if people will think because the Irish and the British have obviously a lot in common with cultural affinity, same language and all, that there will always be a suspicion that we might be the soft touch. So we're going to be hard. And I just remember saying, but that's madness. And uh, and then, of course, the referendum occurred <coughs> and the um, the result came out the, the wrong way from the Irish government's point of view. Um, even though they, 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 they campaigned in Britain, they did virtually nothing in the north. And because, and this is another thing, in the recent years before Brexit, the Irish government had essentially politically left the North. I mean, even loyalist uh, people used to say to me, where have they gone? There's nobody here. We never see Enda Kenny on the streets up here. We, there was a time we couldn't get rid of Bertie O'Hearn, Brian Cowan, things like that. We, we had uh, these officials all the time. So they, had, they, had, they, hadn't, they hadn't got the kind of coalition or, uh, of things to actually... Um, produce a vote in the north if they needed to. And remember, West Belfast polled at less than 50% in the referendum. Um, so they were completely unprepared, and afterwards mm. I thought that there would be, yeah, as we would, if there was. Room. Pardon? Sorry. I was going to say, I thought after a failure, the first thing you do has to have a post mortem. And what's gone wrong? Yeah, Who's better? Yeah. Who gave these policies? Who did all this? And essentially what happened then was that they announced that it had been a big success and anyone who was involved was all clapped on the back and almost given medals. And I couldn't believe it because, you know, there was, it was Alice in Wonderland world. It would, it would have been a failure, but the failure was obviously not us, it was the Brits. And it was the fact that the, the, the electorate did the wrong thing. Uh, and as I said, uh, that, was the final, <coughs> that was the final thing that drove me to write that article. Wow. And I gave it to Ian Kyo, <coughs> uh, uh, who is um, editor of the Sunday Business Post. And Ian, I, I waited about two weeks during the discussion with Ian before I let it go. And as I said, I didn't expect anything like the, uh, the, the reaction from my former colleagues. Uh, although, to be quite honest, the politicians were fine. I was saying this to Thomas. Charlie Fanny was Minister of Foreign Affairs and he said, that's fine, we're well used to these arguments, but the officials, as he said to me, are very, very precious yeah. and uh, regarded me as a, as, as a traitor. Um, 
So it was that it was it was that scornful issue both to the importance of our relations on this island and our personal relations with, with, with Britain that, that drove me into this into this position. Um, so the first question I, I, I kind of reflected on and said, why do so many people, able people, and they're not fools or anything like that, within government, both polit polit political and official, why are they so pro-European? What is the motivation here? Because objectively, and maybe because I come from a scientific background, what is the evidence here um, for, for it? Obviously, people would say Ireland benefit from years in the European Union, but um, the degree of identification and the degree of the degree of um, of sort of, as I say, resistance to people who would say anything different isn't it isn't I believe totally irrational, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who are actually Im imbued with Euro nationalism and uh, you know want to create the United States of Europe, but I think there are very few, and I think, but unfortunately, I think in some <coughs> cases, and I won't say some cases, there's a much baser reason for this. And, and that is, I think that the, 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 the whole operation of what's known as the European project has had a corrupting influence in Ireland and public officials, both po political and official. Um, because the, if you watch when a European Commission job comes up, how many people in the government want it? The actual re the rewards for working in Europe are huge relative to working in a, in a national ser service. Now, I don't know whether this is true, but there was a website that said there are 10,000 civil servants in Brussels who earn more than the Taoiseach and earn more, have a higher take-home than the Taoiseach or the or British Prime Minister. And the amount of, of, of perks that's given to them uh, is, is incredible. So, I mean, to, to quote Bevan, if they're so enthusiastic, why do you have to stuff their mouths with gold? Why, why do you have to pay them so much? Um, um, so, I have no doubt that, 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 that um, people aspire to, uh, to, um, to these uh, extra uh, amounts. And, and, and I don't mean to... I'd say plenty of people have been convinced of it. And when you, you never, never underestimate careerism, either in politics or in, or in the civil service, that if people think that this is important for them in, within the party or within the go, government structure, they'll go along with it. But I think the, the amount of what I call payola in the system has made it uh, has made it much more difficult to argue this case. And you have organisations like the European Movement. I only, even though I was on the board of Foreign Affairs, I only found out recently that Foreign Affairs give them 185,000 a year. And you, you, you just look through the amount of grants and all. And I don't think government should be in the, in the business of supporting um, um, organisations who are there campaigning on a political issue. I think we should, again, just like the referendum, we should have a, an even playing uh, uh, structure on it. Um, as I say, uh, the, 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 the actual the endowment of, of, of schools for EU, um, the children of EU, um, um, Officials, they get massively la lavished with 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 with, with, um, with extra funding. Why do we have to give them so much more money than anybody else? Uh, if if they believe it, surely that you know people will work uh, in an area for their for for the good of their country or the good of their fellow citizens. Um, and I was always stunned that the Irish government would regularly try to <coughs> push some of our able people to go to Brussels and. And, and particularly into this new foreign foreign ministry of the of, of the European Union, and yet when you meet the people who the Germans dumped in it, they'd obviously got rid of the worst of people in it. To be quite honest with you, uh, but that's a personal thing. <laughs> so, you know, to um, to 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 the other thing is that if you are giving a, a, a Euro critical view, it's very, very difficult uh, in Ireland to, to break through the wall of, of uh, in the mainstream media. I, I've spoken to journalists who I would have known from my time when I would be briefing them off the record on various things in the north and various things, who tell me that their paper have an editorial policy. So one of them said to me, look Ray, even if I want to write something nice about you, I couldn't. There's no argument. It's, you know, in terms of a lot of the, 
of the of the, of the press in, in 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 the republic particularly there is no free speech uh, on, on matters relating to Europe. Um, there's a few exceptions, and occasionally the papers that show themselves as being liberal will ask somebody in. But there is a the, the mainstream media is 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 overwhelmingly um, uh, pro-European. I always say, say to them, you know, if you've ever taken a trip for Europe, you should declare it. I remember one of the biggest reactions I got was. At a meeting of, of officials, I proposed that anybody who negotiated with the European Union should not be able to take a job for five years afterwards. Because I said, how can you negotiate with somebody if they're going to be your future employer? And needless to say, there was almost people choked on that. I was, I was regarded as being an extremely radical. But it's okay to be a radical on the inside. You can be fairly radical on the inside. There's a, there's, a, there's a difference between inside and outside, but the minute an insider goes outside and says something, they're gone. That's the end. You're blanked for, 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 forever. Um, so, you know, with, with, with the media and then acad academia, there's loads of people being getting grants and various things to produce what's essentially European propaganda. So you've got this huge European machine here in, in, in Ireland, all geared towards making the European Union more popular. So, What's the chances, which is a basic reason for the talk, what's the chances of challenging that? And, um, I mean, obviously, there's an ethical issue in that, you know, if you think something's right, you should challenge it. But I think times are changing, and I wouldn't want to exaggerate it. Even in issues like the media, if you go into social media, social media is much, much more critical of the EU than the mainstream uh, parts. And I love all these phony... EU surveys, always done by the same organisation. I mean, yeah. in governments, you know, we know how you know how to actually get a survey by writing the question. Uh, so you know, always take those things with, with, with a grain of salt, because often you have the answer. How do we get the answer? Comes back, you know. Sorry for the cynicism, but I think uh, you know the European Union. The sheen is starting to come off. I think, uh, or maybe I maybe I'm wrong on that. But you know, it 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 started certainly. I was always critical of, 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 of internally, but you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, dealing with the European Commission and their officials was fine. They were actually very supportive, and uh, you know, once Maastricht and a few others came in, the attitude of those in Europe changed. Before this, they were supportive of governments. After that, they wanted to become in charge. I'll give you an example. During the height of the crisis here in Ireland. The Irish government, and I was involved in it, went to see the Canadian government to open the area up for young Irish people to get to Canada. There was no chance of people getting employment here. So the best thing we could do, I thought at the time, was to go to the Canadian government and say, will you open the opportunity? Because, you know, lots of people, particularly in the building trade, couldn't get jobs. So the, the Canadian Minister for Immigration, was for, his name was Kenny, his family worked for Roscommon, and he was only too willing. So. He made a special arrangement for 10,700 visas for Irish people to go to Canada for two years, at the end of which they'd probably be able to stay or they could come back. And that was great, until the European Union office in, in, in Ottawa heard about it. And they said, well, what's this? is terrible. Because the total UK uh, allocation is only 5,000. Germany's getting 5,000. Um, Poland's only getting 80. I said, well, that's fine. And I, uh, I said, I said, uh, the lady who was the ambassador said, we want to turn them into European visas. And I said, no. And I remember, I, I knew Kenny well, so I went to see Kenny, the, the Canadian minister. He said, we only, I only gave it to you because my family were driven out of Roscommon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you'd asked as a European. So, but the, the, and the same with Irish organisations. The European office was asking for Irish organisations. These, these are our organisations that say, no, the, the Irish organisation in Halifax, Nova Scotia, hardly had any identification with the European Union, but there was an attempt to take over everything. And even when we, we went to, say, see the foreign ministry, there was a, there was a kind of a non... A, 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 there was a bit of a displeasure. The European Union does not... says that they are the projection of the European Union outside the European Union. That's what the whole point of their common foreign and security policy is, that they don't want a specific Irish role or a specific... Uh, De Danish or something. Now they're much harder on the smaller countries than they are in the bigger countries. They're not going to get away with it with France, but they don't like the idea of of, of, of us um, um, showing too much independence uh, in, in the foreign policy area. 
But anyway, I think you know, with me, the the worst came was was was, was during the um, was during the bailout, which, by the way, officially hardly exists in Irish government. Things you would imagine something like this would be number one when you are talking about uh, the European Union. People say it often reminds them of the famine. Immediately after the famine was wiped out, it was a shameful thing. So the Irish tried to forget about the famine, and that's why it only even revived later. So if you start talking about the bailout. Again, you're talking about something that, that they don't particularly li like to hear. Obviously, the treatment of Greece and Cyprus have started to take the sheen off them a, off them a bit. And if you look at the situation at the moment, there's, there's hardly a policy coming out of Brussels which isn't a, a, against our traditional interests. I can't think of any major development in recent times that isn't. Whether you talk about the militarisation, whether you talk about the tax area, whether you talk about any area. So, what... Why are we so pro-European? And, you know, there's a, there's a sensitivity in government about exposing some of the things. One of the things uh, I tried to do when I was doing as a columnist is the very large amounts of money that Ireland is sending to Europe now. There was a time when we, we were net recipients of, 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 a, of a EU largesse, although also that was wiped out by the cost of the bailout uh, to us. But... I had to go through Freedom of Information Acts and various other to find out how much was the net contribution of Ireland to the European Union. Uh, and of course, you get optification, various things. Like that. So eventually, we found out that this year Ireland will transfer net 1 billion to the European Union, which is a very, very, very substantial figure. And the actual contribution this year has risen by 600 million. So when you see there's a budget deficit this year, and they're right at the very bottom of it, they say it's because of increased costs of borrowing and the European contribution. In fact, the European contribution is much bigger, but it's buried at the very end of, of, of what they say. So, I mean, Ireland was a, a big net country, uh, recipient. We're in a much better position now since, the, since we actually make contributions to the European Union. And that contribution is going to change because under Phil Hogan's plan, there's going to be cuts to common agricultural policy. We get about 1.7 billion in receipts. We give them about 2.7 billion. Two thirds of that is into common agricultural policy. So if you cut the common agricultural policy, you, we're going to, that, that gap, that 1 billion gap is going to rise. Plus the fact is that the Commission has said that they want to increase the budget, increase the budget, a smaller EU, but they want a big increase in the budget. Now, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, Finland have all said no, 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 look, we, we, we were all under budget constraints. And yet, the Irish government said they'd be happy, and that's a quotation, to pay more uh, for, uh, uh, on their contribution. And it again, as I say, it's bizarre, to put it, to put it mildly. Um, and obviously the, 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 the whole PESCO area and what was interesting about PESCO was that the fact that the government felt it necessary to rush it through at the last minute and the level, the level of, 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 of votes against it um, in, 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 in the Oireachtas or in the Dáil you know not since the Labour Party was, 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 was Eurosceptical and people forget the, Euro, the, the Labour Party was Eurosceptical and Sinn Féin is skeptical, Eurosceptical or semi-Eurosceptical now that uh, you had such uh, a reaction again at, at a parliamentary level against the piece of EU legislation. So things are changing uh, all the time, um, and I think uh, as, as as things go on, they're going to be, to, 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 to to get worse uh, from an Irish point of view. By the way, a quick comparison with some people think that membership of the European Union is necessary for the single market, which of course it isn't. Norway has full access to the single market. It has a population almost the same as the Republic of Ireland, and their contribution is 400 million a year, just to mention that. They, they pay 600 million less, even though they're a much wealthier country than Ireland, to the European Union, and they have full access to the, to the, to the, to the single market. Uh, it's very hard often to get these figures off government, as I say, uh, and I can't understand because if we were dealing with thing, questions, we gave out the answers very, very quickly. Um, I'd also like to touch a tiny bit on social policy because many people in my age associate the European Union with the, with, with the liberalisation in Ireland of, of, of social attitudes and, uh, and, and, and various things like that. And when we joined in '73, we were the most conservative as well as the most poor, the poorest country of the, of the nine. 
but I think people mix it up um, that, you know, I only learned recently that the marriage ban wasn't an Irish thing. I, I, honestly, it's a European thing. I, I have a friend who was, was doing uh, a PhD in, 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 uh, in Trinity on uh, essentially on women's women's contribution and the in, 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 in during the troubles and she said she did some work and she discovered that the, the, the marriage ban was right across Europe uh, we were very late in moving it but I thought it was a specifically Irish thing but uh, it, it it lasted in the Netherlands quite late and it, uh, a lot of the da a lot of the changes in Britain occurred because of the war but um I don't think we need the European Union to, to oversee us uh, as that we would give equal rights to our gay community or our women's rights. And remember, where the same year as the same-sex marriage referendum in, in here in the Republic, it was turned a similar uh, issue was turned down in Slovenia. So it's I, I try to people to you know disassociate you know modernism and and, and changes in human rights. With, with the European Union, um, it's no doubt in 1973 it was powerful force, but it, it, that we don't need that any longer. And I think there's a slight colonial cringe to think that we need outsiders to get us to treat people fairly. Um, okay, the, you know, let's move on to Brexit and the border. Not going too long. Uh, you know, again, what was it, it, the the border was an issue which which has got me going as well and as people have read it I don't think there's a hope in hell of, of, of the backstop as announced by the Irish government being exempted just don't I, 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 I think people have not looked at what is by the way the first customs border in Ireland was established on the 1st of April 1924 by William Cosgrave and the papers are on the state, state papers he did it on the basis that if you put a border in Ireland, the British have to move it into the Irish Sea. Now, everybody's telling him that, the, that this could divide the island much more, but he went against it. And in fact, the revenue commissioners at the time even asked the government to postpone it, and he said no. So, the first customs posts were put up by the Irish, by the Irish government in 1924. The same type of arguments you sometimes hear are all there in the 1920s uh, uh, about it. And what people should realise as well is that the, the House of Commons passed without division a new, an, an amendment to the Customs Act which made it illegal to have different customs between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And that seemed to make no difference. The fact that not one member of the House of Commons asked for a division on that. Uh, and it gets almost no publicity in Ireland because it doesn't fit in with the, with, 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 with the amendment. Also, as... Dan O'Brien, who's very strong pro-European, pointed out it would be in breach of GATT regulations. You can't do international treaties where you charge different VAT rates between two from different areas in, in, within uh, a, 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 with regard as a national boundary. So I think the government have been pressing on, on a policy which can't work. And I think they're beginning to realise that now because the government policy on Brexit was we are going to work with the European Commission to essentially defeat Brexit, defeat the referendum, or if we can't defeat the referendum, we're going to impose a regime on Britain which essentially makes no difference. And that wasn't going to work, because in the end, uh, the people were going to walk away from that. And, you know, if you're de dealing in a game of bluff, you've got to be in a position where if somebody calls your bluff, you do it. Do you think that if... The British call a bluff and say we're walking away, and let, if you consist, if you pursue your definition of the Brexit, or sorry, of, of the backstop, and we're going to have no deal. So, in that circumstances, the Irish government would have would be required by the EU to establish a border, and yet have difficulty across the, the Irish Sea. It just doesn't make sense. It only makes sense if you are engaged with the European Union in actually defeating the democratic result in Britain. And remember, the European Union is past expert at defeating referenda and election results. I think when we were doing some research, we found 12 or 13 referenda that have gone against the European Union. Now, a few of them have held. They've tried, in Denmark, they've tried twice to introduce the euro. They haven't tried to defeat the Swedish referendum, which have used. But a lot of the other referenda, whether it was Greece, whether it was in France, whether it was in... Uh, in um, the Netherlands, 
or Ireland or Denmark, essentially their view is just ignore it or come or or, come or, or, come or, or, or get it reversed. So that's a huge uh, a, a huge issue, and I just think I just don't like the idea that Ireland is involved. Uh, in, in essentially sabotaging uh, an electoral result in, in Britain. If the CIA were doing it, we'd rightly be up in arms uh, about, you know, sort of saying we wouldn't accept uh, the result. Um, I personally believe, by the way, that whereas the European Union had a good effect on Ireland, it was much, the biggest effect, uh, and I'm a, a product of myself, was the education reforms in the 1960s. That, you know, that massively changed the Irish society, the, the, the free secondary education, and in my case, free university education, which, which changed the, the, the composite of the population. Uh, I think that had every bit as big an effect as the, um, as, 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 you know, uh, the, enhanced, um, the enhanced opportunities yet. But just to go back to the European Union, and, you know, most Irish politicians tend to think of the European Union as an economic project, but in fact it's a political project. I think most people here would, would, would cop on that. And as long as we were getting the money, it was fine. Remember Albert came back from the Edinburgh summer with eight billion in, in his hands, and everybody cheered, and uh, it, it had a transformation to effect on the economy. But essentially, it obviously came at a price, and the price we're going to pay from now on um, is going to be high. Because if you look at the budgetary returns, the contribution by the multinational um, car on the corporate tax side is huge. I think it was eight billion last year, and it's going to be more this year. But in reality, we're not going to get away with that for very much longer. I mean, just read this, read what everybody's doing. Now, it may be that Ireland might be able to veto some of the uh, the consolidated uh, common corporation tax proposals. But in reality, <coughs> member states are going to start taxing. Um, these companies on the basis of where they do their activities. And we are going to take a much lower yield in the future, even if we kept the 12.5%. But the real attack by the European Commission is not going to be on the 12.5%, but it's on the special deals. And to be honest with you, it's ethically very hard to argue with it, that you know, some of these multinationals are paying so tiny amounts of money, and we're not going, essentially we're not going to get away with it in the longer run. Whereas the IDA have been very successful in bringing people in, they wouldn't have been able to do it without the revenue commissioners. And uh, that's something that's going, going to hit us. And it's what people are talking about as, you know, when people say right, we need the European Union, what they're really saying the same is that we need to have the multinationals here who are taking so much of our, of our exports. I, I was in Canada, over 90% of Irish exports to Canada are from the multinationals. Um, the amounts of, 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 of our indigenous companies are very small. Um, and it's very, very heavily concentrated on Britain. SMEs export almost 50% of all their goods to Britain uh, that, that, that do exports. Our agriculture is very, very, very dependent on Britain. And yet, we are, we are quite prepared to imperil that um, for, Europe, for Europe. And I, again, I, it doesn't make any sense in the world to me. Um, uh, Tax harmonisation, obviously, is, got, is, is going to be a big hit, and it's one thing that I think is going to to, to, to change attitudes in Ireland. I think I think we are in an early er, stage. I did an interview there for RT, Russia Today, and they told me they did a Vox Pop about this new party which has been established tomorrow, which I have nothing to do with, but I've been in the papers about it. They couldn't get one person in favour of it. And that's because we're in a conflict situation now between with the British and and on the European side. But when that when the veils start coming off, that I think there's going to be a lot of disillusionment in it, and the, the European <coughs> Union is not going to be anything like as 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 as, as popular. Again, you know, um, Oxfam has described Ireland as the sixth worst country for for tax evade, tax avoidance. Uh, I think we're behind the Bahamas, Cayman Islands, Netherlands, Switzerland, and Singapore. Now, the Department of Finance can argue about how these figures are compiled, but the reality is that, and the attitudes to foreign direct investment in the United States is changing. So before we're hit a bit like the, 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 the bailout, let's start changing our policies. Let's start being less reliant on, on, on those. Um, and the other area, I, am, uh, I hope this doesn't sound like a long stream of consciousness, but uh, the other area is that 
although Ireland is in a particular circumstance because of the border and because of a great desire and a natural desire not to have a physical border there, the, the, the type of Euroscepticism which is sweeping Europe is not sweeping Ireland yet. I mean, just look at our election results in Denmark, Germany, Slovenia, Austria, Hungary, Italy, and everywhere people are rejecting this idea of the centralizing Europe, a centralizing state in Europe. The one change was obviously, um, the one that didn't go that way was France, and that was a particular circumstance as where Marine, Marine Le Pen eventually got up against uh, Emmanuel uh, Macron. Um, so I think that type of European, um, shall we say, rejection of the, of, of, of the status quo and of the way it's going, I think it will eventually affa affect Ireland. And the one thing you've got to remember is, people often say to you, why don't you stay in Europe to argue your case? Well, the problem is the European Union is structured in such a way that it can't reform. Because it's wrong. Margaret Thatcher was wrong, God bless her, uh, that she thought that the European Commission was a civil service. The European Commission is the government. It's not the civil service. So therefore, to actually... And my son showed me this, and he's pro-European, by the way. He showed me... The, the oath they have to take, the oath when you go in to take on the European Commissioner is that essentially you must push the ever closer union. The only people who can bring forward legislation in reality is the European Commission. So how can you get a body who's sworn to, 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 to go in that direction and, uh, and, um, and reform itself? In fact, John Cleese said he would have voted against Brexit if he thought there was any possibility of reform. And I think with the UK going, it's, it, it, there's even less chance of, of, of reform. The other thing I would say about it is that the government's policy on Brexit is starting to come as, uh, apart. You've probably seen stories from Tony Connolly and various things where the Polish governments have said, are we really going to essentially um, sacrifice a deal for, 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 for a small border in Ireland? And you know, given what happened to us on the bailout, don't put your faith in princes. The, you know, if the fact that we are now really relying on Michel Barnier and Jean-Claude Juncker. Remember, in the final analysis, they won't make the decision. And the European Union, the heads of government, particularly the, 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 from the big countries, have farmed this to Barnier. But Barnier has to deliver. And if you read Politico and the various things like that, the sniping against Barnier is growing. And unless he delivers, it'll be taken... The whole portfolio will be taken over but very reluctantly by Angela Merkel and her friends. And I honestly don't, after what was she was doing, what she did with, to Ireland during the bailout, I wouldn't be particularly hopeful that we're going to get a very good deal out of that. I personally think that we're going to end up with a, a, a kind of CETA model. CETA is the Canadian uh, Comprehensive Economic and uh, Trade Agreement with the EU, with a bit more on it. But and I think we are going to have a huge problem at the end as to what to do with the Irish border and also what to do with <laughs> Irish exports going through Britain. Now, at the moment, Ireland exports 15% of its goods to Britain by value. It exports 30% by volume. And if you look at overall our exports, 90% by volume go through the British transport system. That's 80% thing. We, do. we are trying to develop at the moment uh, alternative routes directly to France, but they're not going to work particularly for on, as, uh, nearly as well as on the agricultural side. So we are caught in a bind, and we've got to do some deal to, so that we can get our goods through the land bridge in Britain. In Britain. I've been saying that I really think Ireland should, should take, uh, should take um, the idea of, 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 of becoming an EFTA country much more seriously, because I just can't see us squaring the circle. I know the Irish government have asked for special arrangements of transit through Britain, but if you spend your time kicking the bridge, the chances, and I know this because I've been invited over a few times to the House of Commons to speak, there's a lot of antagonism building to Ireland because of some of the things we're saying. And I know the Taoiseach may have been misquoted over closing the airspace, but it was such a stupid thing to say. You know, you don't, Con Houlihan was a great rice sports writer. He said, never insult the crocodile before you cross the stream. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. And we've been spending our time bashing the Brits. You know, you, you have Fitton or Tool saying, saying, we're in the strong position. I mean, you don't ever get a deal by attacking people. That's, the first thing is stop the rhetoric. Um, 
and we're going to be very dependent on that. So we're, we're in a difficult situation. My own view is that if we went into EFTA, it meant that we still have access, certainly even as a short-term thing, we'd still have access to the single market, but we wouldn't have to stay in the customs union. The big thing on, on EFTA as well is that we, are, we would be able to take back our fisheries. Now, I was telling Thomas earlier, I had huge difficulties in trying to get from the Department uh, of the Marine what percentage of the fish in Irish waters do Irish vessels take? And they wouldn't give it to me. And the British did. And they said it's somewhere between a quarter and 30%. Now, the British only take 40% and they're up in arms. And they say that EU vessels take six times more fish in their waters than they take in, 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 in EU waters. So they're going to gradually phase out the European vessels. So where are they going to go? There's only one place they can go to any great extent, and that's be us. So, you know, there's a lot of things coming down the stream which are not going to be in our, in our, in our interest. Um, and it's going to, 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 hit, to hit us hard. Um, now, as I say, I don't believe that, you know, Leo Varadkar or Pascal Donahue and those are actually mendicious or anything like that. It's just that the whole system has been inculcated here about, about pro-European. You, you can, as I say, you cannot argue uh, it, or as somebody said, you're trying to join up with the Brits again. And there are many times people have said that to me. And I said, why does somebody who's resisting the transference of sovereignty be regarded as somebody who's trying to give up their independence? It's beyond me. Because it, 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 you know, it's, <coughs> everything in the world doesn't come down to the, to the green-orange bit. You know, that Ireland has moved on. We don't define ourselves anymore as being non-British. We have an identity. We have a very strong identity around the world. Anywhere you go, the world, people know about Ireland. Everywhere we go, we seem to be having a, a much higher profile. The only place we haven't got it anymore is in the foreign policy area because we were so curtailed where, you know, if we, 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 we were allowed a certain degree of latitude, but not a huge amount on it. And I just think that it's, uh, it's, 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 it's shameful that we should be so subservient to Brussels because at this stage our greatest interest whether we like it or not is to get the British a good deal the better the deal the British get the better for us because if we can get full frictionless trade we don't have a border we don't have uh, problems getting across the Chequers proposals which have been very heavily criticised are about as good as Ireland could possibly have asked for the Irish government's silence on it was damning they should have sort of said, yes, this is what we need. And if we can't get this, we want special exemptions from, from the customs union and various things like that. But it is, it is, it is maddening to see, uh, to see so little detailed analysis of what is the best thing in our national interest. Um, I think I'm well over a half hour. I better shut up. But, you know, I, I, I went into this. Not a, I, I only the reason is that I think people do need to stand up and say, you know, let's stop getting emotional and because of, of history and various things like that, that we can't, you know, look at what our best interests are. Our best interest is no doubt whatsoever <coughs> is, is, is trying to get the European Union and the British to compromise. Going on one side totally and putting your, man, your course to one mast is just not good politics and it's not good anything. Okay, many thanks. Thanks very much, Ray. It was a very, very interesting uh, talk there. And there was a, a lot of issues covered in it as well. So we're going to open to the floor now for anybody that wants to ask questions or tease out, uh, some of the arguments out further. And there's a mic going around there. So if you put your hand up and the mic will make its way to you. And then if you, give, you ask your question, then maybe introduce yourself first and ask a question. 